this morning as we gather together, I can't help but get fixated on these words of the songs that we just sang, and it, especially the last one that we sang, where it says, we gather here for you, Lord. And I think we're living in a society where so very often it's so easy for us to gather because we like the music or because we like the message or because we like the people. This is where my friends are. It's so easy for us to gather because we're lacking the community. But at the same time, we are gathering together as a church for Jesus. The reason why you got up this morning is because of what He's done in your life. So very often we gather with a misconception of who He is. And this morning, and even last week, we've been speaking into who Jesus is and what He is, if I can put it that way. Because so very often Jesus is that person who God sent to do some stuff so that now I can have my life and have it abundantly. There are so many churches who preach with a good heart that once you become a Christian, life will be easy. I don't know about you, but it generally takes you about being a Christian for about, for about five seconds to realize that life very often still carries on. Sometimes the Lord releases us from something and life is golden in a certain aspect, but we're still stuck in a broken world. But yet, very often we hear messages preached completely out of context, focusing on stuff like this. That confuses us to some extent. I want to read for you from, we've got lots of scripture today, so for those of you who want to take notes, um, get ready. But they're not long passages. From Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30, and it reads as follows. Then Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Context, Jesus was just condemning the cities that didn't accept him despite the fact that they saw miracles. Jesus is saying, I gave you all these miracles and yet you failed to accept me for who I am. They saw miracles, but yet they struggled to take him and receive him for who he was. So then he transitions over to those who are wanting to accept him. He says, come to me, those who are weary and who carry heavy burdens. Now, I don't know about you, but I've gotten stuck in this text every now and again. I'm like, Lord, like, why is life difficult? You're saying, like, come to me now, I'm, I'm there with you. And then it carries on in verse 29 and it says, take my yoke upon you. I want to explain something because it took me about 10 years of being a Christian to find out that Jesus wasn't speaking about eggs there. I only discovered a couple of years back that apparently a yoke is something that oxen use that they sort of hook on there before they pull. Might be because I'm Afrikaans, I don't know, but if there's any other Afrikaans people thinking that Jesus is talking about breakfast, he's not. Take my yoke upon you. So this weight, this, this thing that, by the way, it's not... He didn't say take on my sofa so that you can recline. He said take my yoke, which means there's work. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. Because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy to be. And the burden I give you is light. And I've gotten stuck in this text. And I wouldn't wondered, like, Lord, why am I struggling? Why is it difficult? Like, why does it feel like sometimes life can be heavy? At the same time, I hear messages like this where people, they love John 10.10. 10. You know, I, where it reads, the, thief, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. But yet my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Some translations speak about how I've come to give you a life, a life of, of abundance. Some speak about a life of expectation. And I'm thinking, well, Lord Jesus, this is what you came, and I'm, and, and I'm here for that. But I'm not experiencing it. Like, why? Am I the only one who sometimes struggles with that? Like, I'm, I'm difficult. Like, it feels like life is a struggle. I heard this week from a close friend of mine that apparently, when they were growing up, they thought very much as many of us do, doctors don't get sick. Sometimes we think preachers don't get tired or, or discouraged. It happens. Generally, the reason why preachers know their Bible so well is because they get stuck in texts that they don't understand and they're really praying and hoping for answers. 
But now the problem is we have these texts on this side that speak about how God has come to give us life and life in abundance and the fact that what He's giving us should be light and not be heavy despite the fact that it is still work. And now I want to cross-reference that to confuse all of us with a couple of passages that I'm very, very sure were not the theme outside of your Bible study classroom. I'm going to start with 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. I don't see that in t-shirts, fridge magnets, top of a Bible cover book case. I can see it. People chanting, we will suffer persecution in excitement. For some reason, these texts are skipped. Not because we've got a hidden agenda, but sometimes we don't know what to do with them. There's another one, Philippians 1 verse 29. I think this one expresses it quite the best, although that's not the main text for today. Philippians 1 verse 29, and it reads, For, for you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ Jesus, or in trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for Him. Who remembers that from Sunday school? I'm not trying to scare you. I feel that when we look at Scripture, we need to do what Jesus did when He was tempted in the wilderness. Because the devil came, for those of you who missed it, and the devil came with Scripture saying, did God not say this, the same as He did with Adam and Eve? Confuse them with Scripture. But Jesus' response was the whole time, yes, that is true, but it is also written. I'll never forget when we had COVID and life was just like chaos. The amount of messages that I received on Psalm 91, like how many people received that? And uh, like so many people just like I claimed it, like no sickness will ever enter my house because of the Lord's blood. And like they just claimed it like, like any other. Oh, Despite the fact that that is the same chapter that Satan used trying to tempt Jesus and saying like, I will not stump my toe, the angels will come and protect me. These things are true that it's in the Bible, but it's not something that we can use like an abracadabra Harry, Harry Potter vibes. It's, it's not. It's a truth that the Lord will do that when that's His will. But we need to read stuff in context and we need to read it correctly. Because Jesus' response was, yes, that is true, but it is also written. So now we've got on the one hand, we've got all these scriptures that says, I've come to give you life in abundance. I've come to give you healing. I've come to bring you blessing. I've come to bring you all these wonderful things. But at the same time, if we carry on with the actual text for today, Colossians 1 verse 24, Paul speaking from prison, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the suffering of Christ that continue for his body, the church. He is glad that he is suffering and continuing what Jesus is doing or what Jesus started today. Who here has been told countless times and remembering that text now, but Jesus said it is finished. That's what he said on the cross, like Jesus said it. It's true. What was needed for our salvation, the price to be paid, paid in full. Done. Nothing to be added. Perfect sacrifice. But yet we're still here. Yet the Holy Spirit sends us a helper. There's still work to be done. Think about that yoke. We are still carrying on the sacrifice of Jesus in our own bodies and how we do it. I'm going to be explaining how and how all of this fits together, but I feel that there's something very important that we should focus on there. Because first and foremost, we have the book of Colossians, which Paul is writing. He was writing at the same time to the Ephesian church and Colossians and also to Titus at the same time. And he sent these three letters with the same messenger. So he had the same mind frame. But he sent specifically to the Colossians because of their misunderstanding who Jesus was. We sang the song, Jesus, we're here for you. In the next couple of weeks, I hope and I pray that Jesus reveals himself to us so that we can actually know who we're here together for. So Paul is writing, I'm going to repeat verse 24, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the suffering of Christ that continue for his body, 
the church. In trying to explain this this morning, trying to figure out how is the best way to sort of explain this, I couldn't help but think of a restaurant. And imagine this for a second. All of us go to whatever restaurant you want to go to. Everyone can sort of decide their own one. You can think of a fancy restaurant. Some of you are thinking about the pig. Some of you are thinking about McDonald's. Probably no one. Um, <laughs> kidding, bad joke. Any case, so everyone's at a different restaurant. Picture this. All of us are there. All your family members, everyone is there. During this time, someone comes in at gunpoint and takes all of our wallets. It's horrible. This isn't where you saw the story going, is it? We haven't got wallets. We're stuck there. And for some reason, we've got this Hitler of a restaurant owner who says, you are not leaving till you pay. Like, they took our wallets. They left. No one's got money. He doesn't want to take EFT. He doesn't want to do anything. We need to pay. It's a bad example. Just work with me. Now you've got one person coming in and say, by the way, I'll pay for everyone. I will pay for everyone. And he pays the check. Done. It worked out to about $2 or 50,000 million rand. And it gets to this point where now we have the opportunity to either go to the counter and say, yes, I accept that, or we can try and scramble looking for five cent coins. We don't have money. We can't pay the bill. Someone else paid it for us. So now on the one hand, we still have the responsibility to go to the front and say, yes, I accept what that person paid before we can leave. But with that, we have this life. But then, I had this question because I started thinking about this. And the more you mull, o- mull over things, the more you start realizing, I'm missing things. Like, I'm, I'm being tasked to stand in front of a church and say, by the way, the Lord's saying, I have the privilege of suffering. Like, that's not a lack of... How, Lord, how am I going to do this? And then I realized what we very often do. Why is it that when we read the Bible, we separate the Bible and the biblical life so far from reality that we forget about what's basically happening around us? Think about it. So now you're thinking, to be a Christian means suffering. As if life isn't suffering enough before you became a Christian. Pause on that for a second. The whole world is suffering. Everyone is suffering. That's why Jesus came. The only difference is now we suffer for a purpose. They're just suffering for suffering's sake. The world is in pain. It's in turmoil. The Bible explains very beautifully in Romans 8. For all creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who His children really are. Because unfortunately, there will be many going to Jesus and say, Jesus, Jesus... I'm yours. And Jesus will respond, I never knew you. Because they had a one-sided relationship. They knew about Jesus, but Jesus didn't know about them. But we're not taught that so easily. And my heart is really much in the same heart as Paul when he wrote Colossians, as you will see in a moment, is to bring that full revelation of who he is and restore that relationship so that we can have a two-way relationship. Carrying on in verse 20 from Romans 8, Against its will, all creation was subjected, to, was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will rejoice or it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. This is something that we're waiting for. It's something that's coming. Something that's beautiful. And then, for we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. This is why we see, if we look in history, there are times when things get bad, and it gets better. And it gets worse, and it gets better. And it gets worse, and it gets better. For those of you who have been around someone giving childbirth, you sort of realize that this is how it goes. Like you realize, like, oh, wait, no, it's not that. Things get better. Oh, no, it's not that. And then it gets better. And it's ten times worse than I was just explaining. I don't want to go to the, it's bad. And then it gets better. And then it gets worse. And the moment you think that she's going to die, as I did multiple times, where you literally sit there and say, Lord, please don't take her. Maybe I'm melodramatic. Maybe I don't, I don't. Maybe it was that bad. We don't know. But there's a point in time where it gets so bad and then there's release. Then there's love. All that pain and suffering is gone. I'll never forget it, and I think I've shared it at the front. I would, especially with Gabriella, 
I literally thought that Sophia was going to die. Really, I did. And even Gabby, there were some complications and not going to get into the details, but it was, it was bad. And like five minutes later, as we were walking to the room, Sophia mentioned something to the point of, well, that wasn't so bad. And I literally stopped this woman who is given birth five to ten minutes back saying, whoa, 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 whoa. I've heard that these hormones and things kick in and then you ladies forget. You need to remember how bad it was to, re- to be thankful for where we are now. There's something that happens that we just forget. And there's beauty in that. So we need to understand that things get better and it gets worse. And the whole of creation is in this point of pain and suffering. There's a reason why even people who have it good, people who have lots of money and comfortable and stuff, there's a reason they get addicted to drugs, alcohol, sex, and everything else they can because they're still trying to escape the gaping void in their hearts. There's a reason why people always want more. The moment you have one thing, you want something else. The moment you have a relationship, something happens and you get uncomfortable, you want the next one. The moment you get a nice house, you want a new sofa. With the sofa, you need a new carpet. With a new carpet, you need a new this. There's always something that we want more. The whole of creation, all of us knows that there's something missing, even to the point of creation with earthquakes and floods and all of this as a result. So I need to stress, when I say that Christians should suffer, for Christ's sake. It's not, don't focus on the suffering. So, suffering for Christ's sake. All of us are suffering. The world is broken. Why are we suffering? Is it just because? Because you're there, like the world is, with earthquakes and all these things, as we saw now in Romans 8, like this, there's destruction and everything is going bad. But now, we need to come back to today's text in Colossians 1, verse 24. I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the suffering of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations, but has now been revealed to God's people. We all lack a mystery. For God wanted them to know the riches of His glory, the riches and glory of Christ, are for the Gentiles too. It's not just for the Jews. And this secret, Christ lives in you. Almighty God, all-powerful God, now lives in you once you become a believer. And please don't do as that church, I think I mentioned to you last week, that Sophia and I nearly visited in Pretoria, where they take this verse, and they take everything in their theology and in their doctrines and in their thinking to this point where they're saying, well, now it means Christ is in me and now I can do all things. And by the way, Jesus wasn't a real person and he didn't real physically was raised from the dead. He just lives in me and we all get a Christ spirit like he's an add-on that someone can get in a Buddhistic type way. Because this is what Paul is directly preaching against, but yet this is what they were catching on. Because in, as I mentioned, he was writing this book on Ephesians, but with Ephesians, he focuses a lot more on the church. Because Christ's body is the church, which means us. So Christ is in us. It's not just in an individual, it's in all of us. This gives assurance of sharing his glory. So we tell others about Christ, not just about the good things, but warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship with Christ. Remember what I mentioned about Jesus saying, you knew me, but I didn't know you? This is what Paul is trying to fix beforehand. We need to understand our relationship with God is a two-way street, it's not one way. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on, on Christ's mighty power that work within me. I've seen this so many times where people have this one-sided relationship where I become a believer and now I, I listen to Christian TV and now suddenly God will bless everything I touch. Like if I tithe enough, I will get enough. If I do this enough and if I start a business, God will bless it because everything I do 
What's, what's that maglet that we go that's actually biblical but taken out of context completely? Everything I do through Christ will succeed? We, we believe that. Yet that entire letter of Philippians is written to help people through persecution. Not to start businesses and relationships and, and arts and crafts. We have this idea that Jesus is an add-on that we just keep on focusing on and He's going to give us everything. And He wants to because He loves us. Just bear with me before you think, Johan, that everything started well. We had new worship things. Things were great. And now you're just landing with this heaviness. But when we start forcing God's hand because we want God to join us rather than His, then we start losing the plot. But the thing is, Paul understood something that we struggle with. There's this point in time where Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he's writing to them about this messenger of Satan, which either could be a physical problem, it either could be an emotional problem, he's struggling with sin maybe, or maybe there's this actual person. And there's this point in time where God is, where Paul is praying to God and he's like, Lord, please release me from this. And Paul writes to the Corinthians three different times in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 to 10. Three different times, I beg the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. And the reason for that is because then we stop relying on ourselves. Do we realize that? It's the moment we start realizing we're weak, that's when God works. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. I need to put this big disclaimer that I can. I don't know how to speak in bold font with all caps and. God does not want us to suffer. God wants us to reduce the suffering of others through truth and service. That's what God wants. We're living in a world of suffering that He came to save and we are currently in the process of waiting for people to come out of their destiny of hell so that we can save them so that we can move on to this new life. It was suffering before we started with Jesus. He didn't add suffering. He just gave you purpose. Because we need to understand that when we are living righteously, the world doesn't like it. They don't. Because if you start telling someone that they're doing something bad, they feel judged. But now, how do we live this out practically in our life? The last text for today is in Matthew 6, verse 25 to 34. This is something that we've heard countless times, and I'm going to beg you, please do not fade off because you've heard this countless times. Jesus is speaking about the world, and He starts off with, Blessed are the poor, blessed are those who are facing persecution, they will be saved. And He carries on with this whole message. And it culminates with this. This is why I tell you, that is why I tell you, not to worry about your everyday life. Whether you have enough food, to, enough food and drink, or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food, and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't work to make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that today are, that today, um, that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, He will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Yet your heavenly Father already knows all these needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and He will give you all you need. Not want. Need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Spoiler alert. Today's trouble is enough for today. What does this mean? Because we read these things and every time it's like, Lord, what, what, what am I supposed to do with this? 
and means in practical sense, if I can summarize this whole message, that everything we do should be focused on, Lord, what does your kingdom want? He doesn't say, don't, you know, don't, don't plan supper for tomorrow. That's ungodly. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying don't have a retirement plan financially because you're being good stewards of your finances. He's saying where's your focus? It means every decision we make should stem from, Lord, what will bring you glory? Before you move, Lord, do you want me to move? Before you start a business, Lord, do you want me to start a business? Lord, how can I build your church? Which means the people around us, but also the local body where you're connected. Everything should be about that. And if there's time for anything else, then that's what we should do. Saying, Johan, that's impractical. I need to work. I need to do this. Yes. But look at what the Lord is laying on your field today. What is He laying on your heart? What choices are you having to make? Do you reason what do you think is the most practical, the best solution? Or do we start our reasoning with, Lord, what do you want? And even if it means I lose my business or I do this, and if I fail, I accept it. Because I'm trusting you, because I'm putting your kingdom first. I read a quote this week. Now, for those of you who don't know the word zeal, any of you are Afrikaans like me, zeal means passion and conviction and, and striving properly. And this very well-known Christian artist wrote a book about worship and he starts speaking about just how we live our Christian life. And he says the following, I have found zeal to be one of the most misunderstood things. That conviction, that fervor, that passion. Today, if you went around proclaiming to be consumed with a zeal for the house of the Lord, you would probably risk being institutionalized. I have noticed that when anyone starts getting very zealous, people start getting very nervous. When people start getting very excited about the Lord and start calling people to actually live that Christian life, People get nervous. If you start talking about acting and living radically for God, and I love this in commas or in in brackets, also known as just doing what Jesus commanded. If you start talking or acting and living radically for God, also known as just doing what Jesus commanded, it's amazing how many people immediately seek to caution you and temper you. Just, just calm down. Like, don't be radical. Don't be that guy. It's funny though, because no one seems to warn you about the cost of living apathetically or half-hearted in obedience to his commands. This is unspeakably more costly. The moment we start wanting to be radical for Jesus and really wanting to do what he says, then people start cautioning you. No, 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 you need to be careful. Yet yeah, this is exactly what the Lord is calling us to. We'll see in the next couple of weeks how we start speaking about dying to ourselves and actually living for Jesus. And yet we have this idea that when we die for ourselves, we can still carry on with my objectives, my motives, and my dreams for life. It's not about that. Dying to yourself is not comfortable. But yet for some reason, we've been so preconditioned when we die to ourselves, it's going to be comfy. And the Lord wants to add to my life. But Jesus said, those who lose their life will gain their life. Those who die to themselves and carry their cross will strive in business. No. Those who die to themselves will live godly life and inherit the kingdom. When we start putting his kingdom first. Now what am I trying to say with this whole message and how everything sort of comes together? We need to start realizing that Jesus died for us. We are gathering for him and we should be passionate about it. Yes. When we live our life and we say something, we shouldn't be like, oh, I hope I'm not offending you. No. In love, say, Jesus told me I need to do this. Or be radical and say, I feel the Lord saying I should do this. And if you're not sure what the Lord is saying, then go to someone and say, I would like you to pray with me because I'm struggling to hear the Lord. Because that means putting His kingdom above your discomfort. It means when we worship, you actually worship and you don't worry about what the person next to you is saying, despite the fact that all of we, all of us, to a large extent, still are. I feel that the Lord is calling us to start living radically for Him. Not because I say so, but because we should start seeing it as a pleasure to suffer for Him instead of just because the world sucks. If I can paraphrase the Bible. Because Because life sucks. Everything is broken. The world is cursed according to God. But are we just living in that sucky life? Or are we living 
for Jesus. And if there is bad consequences, I'm willing to take it. Because that's where the difference lies. Let's be encouraged by it. Let's step forward and say, Jesus, please, I want to be that person. So this morning, I'm going to ask all of us to stand as we pray. Sort of as a symbol of us actually standing up for ourselves. You can do that now. And I really want, as we're standing here, for you to just pray in your heart and say, Lord, let this conviction and the zeal for your house and your faith transform us so that we can actually live that life. Let's close our eyes and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to say thank you so much for this morning. I pray that you encourage us this morning, Lord. Take away that fear, Lord. Take away that confusion, Lord. Help us understand that having a life rich and full of life and abundance, Lord, means experiencing your peace in the storm, Lord. Help us understand that in these times of of difficulties and troubles, there's a sense of peace and enablement that you provide to us, Lord. Give us that peace. Give us that encouragement and obedience. I pray that you strengthen our faith, Lord. Help us seek you with everything in us, Lord. And forget about our comfort zones, Lord. pray this not because we deserve it, Lord, because we don't. But because you have called us for more and we want to step into that one step at a time. Please help us. Amen.